Hi, uh, Happy New Year to everyone, Year of the Ox. So uh, actually, uh, a great welcome to everyone. And, and this is the, uh, the first shot of our uh, joint industrial conference series uh, between the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, Faculty of Engineering, uh, and ASTRI. Well, in fact, uh, our, our actually working relationship or our research relationship dated back about, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And in fact, uh, you know, and, and, and some 2017 when we first started a joint lab and we have to have some research projects going uh, along. So, uh, so uh, uh, in, the, in this coming year, uh, we have actually planned a series of uh, seminars or talk series. So this is uh, our, 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 our first seminar. And uh, in particular, this seminar is for exploring 5G uh, uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, uh, looking into the leadership and the uh, uh, and, and, log and logistic automations. So uh, the rundown uh, of today's talk will be, uh, there'll be three sessions. Uh, there'll be two talks followed by a panel discussions. Okay, so, uh, so without further delay, uh, I'm going to uh, invite the first speaker to speak to us. Uh, our first speaker is actually uh, Vincent, Vincent Howe, uh, who is now uh, uh, the senior manager of the Next Generation Network Platform at Astri. Oh, he is actually responsible for emerging technology development and innovation, and is leading uh, multiple uh, new project initiatives in, in Hong Kong which includes uh, 5G networks, autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, connected vehicles, and uh, industri industrial uh, internet of things. Uh, and Vincent actually obtained uh, his uh, uh, BA in electrical and electronic engineering uh, from uh, Newcastle University in the, in the UK, and then an MBA uh, from the Hong Kong UST. And prior to joining to Astri, uh, Vincent actually has worked as a a senior solution consultant uh, in solution sales for a multinational telecommunications company uh, across Europe and Asia regions. He has a, a rich cross domain knowledge and experience, including 4G, 5G technologies, satellite communications, smart mobility, and uh, data science and IoT. So, uh, may I now invite uh, uh, Vincent? Uh, to deliver uh, the, today's talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Wong. Um, so first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Vincent from Austria. Um, so today my topic we're gonna share is about uh, 5G leadership in Hong Kong. So I won't talk about too much about 5G, the overview of the general idea because of the 5G already here. So um, my focus today will be more on what exactly happened in Hong Kong, uh, what we have been deployed with the 5G. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, sorry about the technical is, uh, problem. So today I'm gonna to talk about the Hong Kong um, leadership in 5G. Um, so specifically, uh, I'll introduce about two parts. Basically one is uh, why is matter in Hong Kong? What we're we doing here in Hong Kong, why? Hong Kong doing on 5G. And also second part is what we have de deployed with 5G. We're gonna select uh, some uh, real use cases what we're doing this year and last year, recent, recent cases, and to show you how the 5G actually helping the, uh, the industry uh, from different perspective. So uh, very short about us three, we've been uh, work here for almost, uh, it's, it's, it's my, it was my, our 20th years last year. Um, so this, our 21st year this year in 2021. Uh, we right now we have more than uh, 600 engineers uh, in our in our building. Uh, we're the largest one of the largest R and D in Hong Kong, which is uh, we're focusing on five uh, technology pillars: um, smart city, fintech, uh, health technology, intelligent manufacturing, and uh, also the uh, uh, integrated circuit. So uh, what we're gonna discuss today is about, uh, is under the smart city pillar, the 5G and smart city. So without further ado, we talk about 5G. As already mentioned, the 5G is already on. Um, we've been seeing the 5G plan, the services provided in Hong Kong right now. Um, but from our perspective, 5G is only like uh, 
for B2C, for consumer level, uh, 5G only use like 10% of its potential. We believe that 90% of the, of the 5G that come from the B2B business. And this is where we're gonna talk, discuss about today uh, in my PPT, uh, especially for the industrial and the small mobility area. So uh, about 5G, what we have done here in Hong Kong, uh, why does it matter? Actually, Austria been working on 5G for uh, almost a decade. Uh, we, we started uh, 4G 10 years ago, and that's our foundation to, of 5G. And we started the 5G real deployment in, in 2017. And we are very proud to announce that uh, last year we have an end-to-end, the 5G all made in Hong Kong, technology from the base station all the way to the call network, and we own the full IP. So because we are uh, funded by Hong Kong government, so we can say that Hong Kong, we have our own uh, 5G technology end to end. So as I mentioned, we started uh, from the foundation of 4G uh, 10 years ago, and uh, we started the 5G in 2017. Just within three years, we come out with our own virtualized call network, 5G call network. And then we have our own 5G uh, base station as well. It's, I think it's, uh, our technology being recognized by an industry, for example, our ORAN, the radio access network part, uh, we are the only vendors right now in the, in the industry that can support both x86 and also ARM based. And that's quite unique. Uh, and also we have been attracted lots of partners to come to Hong Kong to do the 5G here in Hong Kong, including, including lots of uh, telecom or uh, traditional telecom vendors or uh, giants. And for our solutions, we is perfectly for uh, indoor coverage in the future, especially when we talk about 5G, it's a high spectrum. So we're expecting a, uh, the, the, the coverage and penetration is gonna be very low for the indoor coverage. So we, you are expecting to deploy more and more indoor space stations in the future to support the 5G full coverage. So our solution provide a very low cost and a very efficient, uh, high performance uh, solution for the base station especially. And in the future, even we think about the future business, especially in Hong Kong, we have lots of SI here in Hong Kong. System integrators, they have their own network and capability to deploy the new services like Wi-Fi hotspot or the, the IoT solutions. You could do the similar to 5G. In the future, um, the SI could, in Hong Kong, they could uh, leverage the, our solution and deploy this, what we call the neutral host. So basically, because most of the operators, they may not be able to cover all the indoor coverage in Hong Kong. There's so many buildings and the different floors. So in the future, that could possible a business model that where SI or some system integrator, they could build the infrastructure in advance and lead back to the operators for a new business model. So this is actually where we see uh, the future base station is coming into this picture. And another thing I also mentioned, there's another important part is about 5G call network. Uh, we've been working on call network for so many years. Uh, we actually, um, we work partner uh, originally with uh, Intel. We, we actually last year in Mobile Congress, we, where both company announced the, our uh, 5G core reached to very, uh, very high performance industry leading 1.3 terabyte per, uh, uh, per uh, server unit. So that's actually the uh, work, uh, le uh, leading the performance and also we check lots of uh, partners uh, around the world to license from Hong Kong and on this 5G technology. Uh, in terms of call network, we can see it's treated as a switch, basically handling all the signalings and also process all of all the data. And we can support uh, with high end servers all the way to the down very small mini PC. They can run a full stack of 5G. And we probably the only uh, we are the only solution right now in the industry can provide this uh, elasticity architecture on 5G core. Um, so with all this, we, we mentioned what we did here in Hong Kong, we provide the base station and a core network that combined together is what we call the easy 5G. And this is our new uh, slogan, also our solution. We all want to try, attract more uh, Hong Kong, uh, I think local SIs or startup, they could think if you want to get into the 5G business, with lower barrier, then it could come to our Austria and we can talk about the easy 5G. It's not as hard as you think. Uh, so this is, this is actually where we, this idea come from. And our solution is fully a uh, global standard um, because Austria, we are, we are the member of ORAN Alliance. Also we're a member of 3DPP and 5G standard. We also contribute the standard every year. And also we are a member of ITU. So all our solution is fully global standard and uh, with no proprietary is everything follow the standard. 
And our, uh, Hong Kong 5G has been recognized by the industry for the past five to 10 years. And uh, we every year we've been promoting Hong Kong 5G to the world. And hopefully the, the more people that will be come to Hong Kong and do the real 5G development here with us. So talk, we'll talk about the foundation of fundamental technology. So how about the application we've been working on? Um, actually, Austria, we've been working with so many different parties on, uh, on the, to push the 5G application deployment. Uh, for the past few years. Uh, we've been working on smart mobility. I'm gonna talk about that later in my slides. We, we are already building the, the, I think one of the largest 5G, uh, the new 5G infrastructure in Hong Kong Science Park to enable the AI and the, and the neuron platform, uh, leveraging the neuron platform to, to provide the AI seamless experience in Hong Kong Science Park. That's what we call the 5G test bed. And uh, also we're working with different partners to leverage some blockchain IoT solutions to provide a seamless and uh, very, with data integrity and also the data sharing uh, on the 5G network. So today, since we, we're gonna have uh, some focus, so we're gonna share two cases what we're working on right now. One is industrial IoT and one is smart mobility. So industrial IoT, um, people talk about that a lot and um, we think the foundation of 5G can provide a very strong application for industrial IoT. For example, the TSM time sensitive network, a URLC for low latency, massive, uh, massive uh, uh, IoT MTC or EMBB can provide a different, um, tech, uh, can meet the different demands uh, from uh, industrial IoT or, uh, or industry. And we are expecting a huge growth in uh, 5G also in, the, in, this, in this specific uh, market, especially come from the sensor part, robotic, and also monitoring. So actually, if you think about 5G, what they can provide to the industry, people just talk about uh, maybe the higher bandwidth, um, and, but from my, our perspective is it will be more uh, immersive. Uh, so from my later example, you will see, we find the sweet spot we found a sweet spot that actually really can help the industry can reduce uh, the cost, especially for industrial IoT. Um, this is why they need to introduce 5G. So uh, in my slides, we, we're gonna talk about, uh, we developed a new system that's what we call the 5G plus visual. Uh, so enable high precision, uh, high precision positioning for the smart factories. So generally speaking, what we did is uh, we tried to fix the problem that Lots of factories or uh, indoor warehouses, they are leveraging lots of markers and also the, the either by a cheap, uh, very cheap low end robot with tons of marker on the ground, like Amazon did, or they could ha have a very high end robot, which costs 400,000 something for each robot to, to do the navigation. So what we're trying to do is we're going to leverage 5G to provide a very low cost uh, and efficient um, system that can apply to all the uh, robots, any moving object uh, in, or moving up a robot in your factory. Or in... So here we're gonna leverage two things. One is what we're gonna talk, we're gonna use the 5G base station, use the uh, TDOA and also the, uh, AOA, the time arri uh, arrival of time, um, uh, arrival of, uh, sorry, a time arrival, uh, time, time arrival uh, to define TDOA, to define the, the the position of the object. Uh, and this solution can actually define to the 0 0.5 meter to one meter, still not good enough. But what we can do is we also add the visual ourselves. The SLAM solution is the problem with SLAM is sometimes SLAM visualized, you need a lot of time to do the training. And when you go to the, the factory, lots of scenarios or environment, they look the same. And it's very hard for SLAM to adopt the environment. So what we're trying to do is we combine the 5G and the visual together to come up with a new algorithm to, to do the fusion, fusion calculate calculation. And then we come out with a more accurate, this is goes to centimeter grade positioning. And this can be used for so many areas, uh, indoor, outdoor, and it can be quickly deployed. And all the computing will, will, will be uh, uh, it, uh, executed online. So that means we don't have local computing. All the robots can do their positioning through 5G on the cloud. And here example, we, we actually we started this project with Foxconn back in 2017, when we, they, where they started the 5G with us. And here's, uh, here's uh, some uh, 
this is just a um, teaser of what, we, what we're doing right now. It's not fully ready yet, but uh, you can see what we have done so far. This is a very short uh, videos. So basically what we did is um, we, we built a whole platform that we actually just used two things on the robot. One is a very low end camera and one 5G SIM card, that's it. So basically we tried to load down the cost for each of the robot to, to achieve the uh, very high accurate uh, precision. As you can see here, we, we have the robot running in our office. All the computing is running on the cloud and it can they can detect, it can we do, do so many uh, so many interruption to the to the machine or robot, and it will always get back to their original workflow. This is a very intelligent uh, system. They will keep learning every time you run, and this system can apply to all the robots running in the same factory. So basically, you don't need to define the logic for every single robot. Just through the 5G, you can have a central brain, and it synchronize all the map and the situ uh, positioning through the camera and the 5G connectivity. And this will significantly lower the cost of the robot. So basically you just need a motor. And without any lighter sensors, you just need a camera and a 5G sensor. And you can achieve a centimeter grade precision. This will be significant, uh, reduce the cost. And that's why we need to introduce 5G in the factory instead of just have a fancy bandwidth. This can really do the job. So another quick uh, example is about smart mobility. Uh, we've been working on smart mobility for, for years. We are focusing on both um, autonomous vehicle and also connected vehicle. So basically, actually, this is also aligned with the government uh, smart city roadmap, especially this is a roadmap from a transport department. They are also focusing on connected vehicle and autonomous vehicle. They believe that two technology will ultimately uh, go together to serve a better smart mobility applications. So for us three, we've been uh, dedicated to, to V2X uh, for, for years, connected vehicle technology for years. Uh, actually, our roadmap, our concept is we started with the connected vehicle and then we moved to intelligent roadside infrastructure to enhance the capability of V2X and to serve the autonomous vehicle in the future. So our ultimate goal will be connected autonomous vehicle. And this is our, actually our roadmap. And we use, do this through 5G and V2X technology. So we've been provided lots of different uh, use cases uh, in the area. And actually the V2X has been uh, recognized by the industry. Uh, 3DPP is leading the standard and also supported by lots of uh, in, uh, automotive industry. So for us three, we've been working on V2X for years, uh, as I mentioned, and this actually in 2021, we're gonna launch the first, uh, I think world, one of the largest uh, V2X city trial in Sha Tin, uh, from Science Park all the way to downtown and get back to 14 kilometers is one of the largest. So here is a very short video as a, as a teaser. Actually, we have an official video coming. But here is to give you an example, uh, what's the status of what we're doing here so far. Actually, as mentioned, we started the, the, the V2X back in, in Science Park back in 2017. And uh, at that time, there's a, we just tried to do the, the, the trial in, in Science Park. And then 2018, we, we moved to uh, Wuxi uh, and joined one of the national projects at that time. Um, it's quite big at that time, six kilometers is already the world largest. Uh, we invited a transport department also. Um, we serve lots of uh, government uh, officials. And this year, with 14 kilometers, we're going to build in Hong Kong is double the size of uh, Wuxi one. Uh, we're going to demonstrate so many different use cases, uh, more than 10 different use cases that's customized for Hong Kong. Actually, we started uh, in 2020, December. Uh, our team is working very hard uh, to build, to re restructure the roadside 
to, to add uh, the V2X uh, Rosai unit. And I think by the end of February this month, uh, we're going to have the world, one of the world's largest uh, V2X trial, in city trial um, in Sha Tin. And we're going to demonstrate lots of cases, as I mentioned. Uh, for example, some cases like uh, pedestrian crossing, um, tricking, tricking alarm, and also we're going to have a runabout. And this is the very first uh, use case that's been deployed in, Hong, uh, in around the world. Uh, this is the first runabout using V2X de runabout detection. So with this runabout, we can detect the potential risks and the trigger alarm to the incoming vehicles. And we're going to have the starting ready in coming March 2021. And uh, we're more than welcome to invite you to, to come to Science Park and uh, join our test by the end of the March this year. OK. So as I mentioned, we, we've been working on uh, V2X. The V2X is not only for uh, road safety, as mentioned. Uh, it actually be, can be deployed with so many applications like highway management, uh, airport, and uh, subway. Actually, we're working with Hong Kong Airport and uh, MTR right now uh, in Hong Kong uh, to, to see how we can use leverage V2X for their safety. Uh, rather than that, and also the traffic management, ERPs, you can also use. But ultimate goal is we're going to leverage the V2X to help the, uh, to assist the autonomous vehicle. And that is why in start, uh, one of the example, as, you, as I mentioned, uh, from, my, from the previous uh, video, you can see we did the runabout. So basically we use some sensors and we're gonna detect, we're gonna digitalize the whole runabout and we're gonna capture each vehicle's GPS or their location without need to install the, the device on the vehicles. So we can, if we can digitalize all the vehicle's position and then we can use V2X to broadcast to the autonomous vehicle and they will have make a better decision when when to fit into the runabout. And runabout is, gonna, is always a headache for all the autonomous vehicle in the past. So we hope through this technology, we can help uh, the company to work on this, uh, uh, this problem. Um, in terms of autonomous vehicle, we started to study the autonomous vehicle since 2018, and we received the first license in 2019. And by the end of that year, actually we re received the first open road license in Hong Kong. Uh, we can mix with the traditional uh, regular traffic in Science Park to do our testing. And of course, the, the autonomous, go uh, the future goal is we, we want to help after the, the Sha Tien trial. We hope this uh, technology V2X can actually be standardized in Hong Kong. And then hopefully we can help that to speed up the, the commercialization of autonomous vehicle in the future. And that is why after the Sha Tien project, we're going to focus on CAV, connected autonomous vehicle in science park, especially with our own vehicles, with science parks coming uh, shuttle vehicles um, to perform like road safety alarm, runabout assistance, uh, uh, special vehicle notification, also remote control. So with all this, we can hopefully we can speed up um, the uh, autonomous vehicle and help to regulate this uh, uh, technology in the future. So, um, so I'm a little bit fast to, to I probably need to, okay, we'll finish my presentation in advance, but in general speaking, uh, 5G is, is, is ongoing. Uh, I think it's, it's already on. We, we provide the fundamental, as I mentioned, we actually, as one of the largest R&D, we provide fundamental 5G technology. So again, if you're willing to uh, get into the 5G business um, and want to provide the fundamental infrastructure, uh, we provide a very unique 5G, easy 5G solution to all the industry. So startups to your, if you're looking for some new ideas, you're welcome to come to us. But if you're looking for some applications specifically, not just a high level idea, but real deployment to get your hands dirty, then you're also welcome to join us uh, and you can visit us in the science park. Um, so if you have any idea or your comments or questions, so feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vincent, for the interesting talk. Okay. So uh, our next speaker is actually uh, from uh, our Department of Information uh, Engineering. 
uh, Henry, Henry Professor Henry Chen. Uh, he actually received his PhD degree from the electrical engineering department uh, uh, from the University of uh, Sydney. And in 2015, he was uh, actually, uh, he actually joined the School of Electrical and Information Engineering uh, of University of Sydney uh, as a research uh, fellow. And then in 2000, uh, July 2019, he joined us in the, our Department of Information Engineering as a, as a faculty member, as a research assistant professor. And uh, his research is actually in the field of uh, wi wireless internet of things with applications to uh, manufacturing, logistics, uh, healthcare, and smart city. And Henry also serves as the uh, a member of the editorial board of IEEE transaction of wireless communications as well as IEEE wireless communications uh, letters. So may I now invite Henry? Okay, thanks Professor Wong for the uh, kind introduction. So, already there. So thanks for coming to my talk. So today, my talk is about 5G for logistic automation, opportunities and challenges. So uh, as Professor Wong mentioned um, from Department of Information Engineering, so uh, my research group is mainly about uh, wireless IoT systems and its application in various uh, verticals, including this logistic uh, verticals. So. Uh, let's first look at the logistics industry in Hong Kong, okay? So, it, uh, and uh, according to a very recent report from the government, uh, it's listing at the end of these slides, um, th there are four key industries in Hong Kong, okay? Financial service, tourism, uh, trade and logistics, professional, uh, uh, sorry, professional and uh, producer service. So we are talking about the trading and the logistics today. So taking together these four contribute a lot uh, to the GDP of Hong Kong and also employed a lot of nearly 2 million person in Hong Kong in, in 2019. So uh, look into details, you will see that these are the details data. The left side is how, how much money each industry contribute. The, the right side is how many people it's contribute to. You can see that actually the uh, uh, logistic part contribute a lot in both sides, okay, in terms of the GDP and in terms of the uh, the people are hired by the industry. So this is a logistics. So today we, we're talking about two things, 5G in logistics. The other one is, is about 5G. Okay, what is 5G? Actually, uh, Vincent already mentioned uh, a lot. So um, the uh, to me, 5G, there is a big shift from uh, 3G to 4G uh, because it start to consider connect, uh, connecting things instead of only connecting people. So as you can see uh, in this triangle ship, I think if you are familiar with 5G, you, you have seen this one for, for thousands of times. So on the top one, we will continue to improve the data service to people and we will provide higher data rate. And on the bottom two part, there, there are many for internet of things. So on the Left side is massive one, massive IoT or massive connectivity. It's mainly for the applications that do not uh, require very high performance, but the number of devices are very large. For example, smart metering is one good example. And smart agriculture, the other one. On the right side uh, is so-called ultra-reliable low latency uh, communications, shortened as UILC. Uh, this is actually pretty new to, to, to the uh, 5G compared to 4G, right? Uh, and this one actually uh, is the one related to what we discussed today, industrial automation or logistic automation, because this one is going to provide a very high performance wireless that make it possible to replace the cables that is widely used in, the, in today's factories or warehouse. So, uh, if there, there is a, a paragraph showing here that this part actually will contribute a lot and has very promising uh, future UILC to support a lot of new use cases and contribute a lot of money there. Uh, and compared to the 
Uh, when we talk about 5G, the, I will also discuss later, there will be Wi-Fi and the competitors. So compared to Wi-Fi, 5G has licensed band. It can avoid uh, the interference for, on ISM band. Also, it, you, you can, uh, the, the, normally the band is uh, well organized that you can uh, uh, avoid a lot of interference there. So you basically your latency and reliability is better, okay? So here are some 5G use cases in logistics. Uh, we start from the right to the left, okay? The right, the first one, uh, it's about connected uh, autonomous vehicles. Also, uh, Vincent mentioned this earlier. But for logistics, actually, these are mainly uh, for trucks because you use trucks to ship uh, the goods uh, to, uh, and also the parcels from city to another city. But I will briefly introduce later. You can also have remote maintenance and control uh, using 5G in logistics and also others, for example, a very efficient port management uh, in logistics using 5G. Um, the last one is, I will talk more, it's about something within warehouse. For example, normally logistic is you have a parcel, your parcel will be collected and then put into a warehouse before it packed into a, 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 maybe a truck and then go to the other side. And then you will be um, unpacked from the uh, truck and then delivered to you. This is how it works. So if you look at about the 5G for connected trucks, uh, it, it, one of the most important thing is to reduce the carbon fingerprint transport industry a wide truck uh, platform. Uh, the, the, the benefits I'm showing here is also based on UK government report. It, it said it will be significant fuel savings, larger than 7%, and or road safety. And uh, it's baking reaction along the, uh, uh, it's immediate because it's co not controlled by people, it's controlled by a network. Actually machines reaction time normally is smaller than, than, than human being, okay? And, it also have improved traffic flow because uh, the, uh, the trucks are well managed uh, and, and one track, basically, a very long one. So uh, another one benefits here is basically now, when, for example, if you have uh, a check your where is your parcel, you only know it's on the road or where it's in which warehouse, but on which part of the road, you don't know that. But if you have this connected uh, trucks, you exactly know uh, where it is. Okay, this is uh, for uh, one um, benefits of these connected trucks for, for logistics. But as I mentioned that there are other applications, I, I do not have time to go to the details, but I will discuss something uh, the, within the warehouse. So the logistic automation within the warehouse is about AGV and also mentioned by Vincent. So, but when, when, when it's come to the, uh, I talk about wireless. I think people are very familiar with uh, wireless because wireless has been part of everybody's life today. We use cellular network, we use LTE, or, or some already use 5G in Hong Kong. We use Wi-Fi at home almost every day. But when you come to the warehouse or factories, actually wireless there are not very popular, okay? So if you see this one, this is a, a, a data given by, um, uh, industrial communication equipment provider called HMS based in Sweden. And you show that there are different colors. One of them is uh, blue color. Um, there are different technologies there, but they are all field bus technology. Where, um, it, it, it's sort of the first generation of industrial communication protocols. And you have different purple colors there. It's called industrial Ethernet. So it means it's a modified version of Ethernet against wide communication technology. So only the, the very last one, the remaining one, is it, wireless. So you see that only it's only account occupies six uh, percent of market share in, in this uh, warehouse or factories. Okay, uh, this is data is given by May of last year. So I start when I see this, I start to think why it is it because. Uh, no use cases, people uh, are not interested in this area. I, I quickly realized that it, it's, not, it's not a crack. People uh, in the industrial communication area, researchers or, or industrial researchers actually put a lot, lot of effort there already uh, in the uh, past decades to try to improve the performance of wireless. 
to make sure it can be used in the industrial environment. Okay, you see that that they, they are of course non time critical one and time critical. For non time critical one, it's okay. Uh, already a lot of technology there, but for time critical one. There are still problems. Even in, in 3GPP today, there are uh, also active discussions how we can make use of the URLC service uh, uh, proposed uh, by 5G uh, to, to use that in the uh, industrial automation and logistic automation. So this is uh, mean that uh, my thinking of no user case is, is not correct. So, but when you look at the performance requirement of um, uh, automation, industrial automation, or uh, uh, logistic automation, because there are some mobilities, it's about AGV control. So you will see that in terms of cycle time, uh, the third column, you can consider that as um, uh, delay, if you cannot understand what is, but it's, it's larger than delay, okay? So you see then uh, in some extreme cases, less than one millisecond, but uh, people familiar with 5G may, may say, oh, oh one, 5G is target for one millisecond, but people did not go too detailed. That one uh, millisecond is, also, is only the radio latency, okay? But this uh, cycle time is sort of the, um, several times of end-to-end -end latency. So it should be around 10 times of the cycle latency. So you see that the, uh, the, uh, the latency requirement is very, very low. And also the uh, availability. Availability means you can understand that as reliability, okay? And uh, we say six, nine or five, nine. For example, uh, for, for some of the extreme case, you see that you can uh, only miss one packet in one million packet, okay? So it's very strict requirement. So this, I think, this is why uh, I, my finding about the low market share of wireless is something like this. So my way of doing this is, uh, is talking, talk to the frontier engineers, okay? So in warehouse, many from mainland, because due to the COVID, I have not got uh, many chance to talk to the engineer in Hong Kong. But I'm going to do that. I hope I can do it soon. So the, the, my impression is industry people do not trust wireless. This, this is the, 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 the impression I have. So when the, their main concerns lies in on the reliability and the security of wireless. So they often ask me two questions. Is your wireless as reliable as cables? Is your wireless as secure as cables? Okay, because from the reliability, uh, they already get you to the cables. And I mentioned that more than 95%, exactly it's 96%, Sorry, 94% is still re regarding the uh, cable communication in the industrial automation area. And also for the security, because wireless is open, not by cables. So it's easy for other people to launch various attacks. So um, they worry about this, okay? And uh, later, uh, it, it was interesting to find that uh, my, 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 this kind of survey is confirmed by another independent survey conducted by a group of Spanish researchers reported in the paper as shown later. So they also found reliability and security as the main concern. So uh, in, in the following, I'm going to show that uh, this does not mean wireless has no future. Okay, wireless do have a future, but we have some problem there to address. So uh, I'm going to show you that um, there, there are two real use cases that I got from uh, our industrial partners. This means that wireless is really uh, needed there, okay? So let me put the short. So this one is, is about how uh, Vincent mentioned, it's about the AGV, uh, it's used in the logistics automation. You can see that this is actually um, a um, uh, fully automated uh, warehouse made by JD.com uh, uh, based in Shanghai. And you, what you purchased will be automated package, even package, and then a robotic arm will place your puzzle on, on the AGVs. This is the AGVs. And then the AGV will do sorting. So by sorting, they will read, maybe they will read the barcode. I don't know exactly, okay? But they read that and then will move to the different holes. And uh, this, this different holes actually have bags under that. It basically, for example, it's connect the puzzle to different area. One of them maybe to Sha Tian. So 
they, they put it there and they finish the sorting. So in this case, the AGV is moving, cable is not possible. So wireless is essential there, okay? This is, this is one of the solution for sorting. There is another solution for sorting, it's called this one, uh, cross belt sorter. This is the other industrial solution that have been widely used. So you see, there is a, a belt there, and you pass all the place to there. And then uh, if your parcel arrive at the right place, it will be pushed down. And this, so it goes to the box, it, it, it expected to go to, okay? So this, how it works. This one, uh, it's not that straightforward. I use this two figure to briefly introduce it uh, furthermore. On the left side, you see that, Actually, there are two belts on the system. One, the belt move vertically, means go into the, the, the screen. So this is the main one. There are, lot, there are small carriages on this uh, main belt. On each carriage, you see that there is a black area. That is another belt. That is why it's called cross belt, okay? And then the main carriage will keep moving forward. And then once a puzzle arrive at the right place, the other belt will start to push, and then the parcel will go down. Okay, this is how it works. And on the right side hand, I tell you how the system works. Basically, this is a wireless control um, solution. So you see that on top, there is a, 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 a controller connected by a very special antenna. It's called the coax leaky antenna. And this antenna, Actually, they're still running the, the wireless signal, but why they use this? Because this technology can always make the receiver, no matter where they are, they, they receive very strong signal, okay? This, this is a, a, a widely used uh, uh, industrial solution. And actually, as far as I know, they, they just run Wi-Fi signal today, okay? Uh, this is the, the solution we have. So before I talk about the challenge, as a quick summary, as you can see that, uh, wireless is not well uh, used, widely used in the, in the industry. This means there is a lot of chance there. If they're already uh, sort of 90% there, we have no chance, right? But um, now only 6%, how about we can make it to 60%? So that is already a very huge market there. And the other way, uh, wireless uh, emerging solutions uh, require wireless as an essential technology, and for example, for this logistic automation um, uh, use cases, means that um, if we do not have some wireless, good wireless technology, we, we may not be able to scale this kind of uh, solution. So this is actually uh, the, the real motivation that push us to work in this area. But uh, these are good potentials. There are also some challenges there. The first one is, you can see that when you go, when I go back to this one, uh, the wireless technology there, the major part is Wi-Fi, okay? And the other two other Wi-Fi, oh, sorry, wireless technology, for, for example, Bluetooth maybe, or Zigbee is there, but LTE is not there, 3G is not there. So why, why is not there? So the main, the main reason for that is, the license ban, it's, it's very expensive. So basically, for example, the operators, China Mobile Hong Kong, they spend a lot of money to purchase the license from the government, okay? And then actually we sort of buy the use of the license from the operators. This is how it's operate, okay? For example, I'll give you an example. This is a very, very uh, narrow uh, range of the spectrum sold in Hong Kong. It's cost uh, 500 million Hong Kong dollar. It's going to be very expensive. So as a factory or warehouse owner, I do not have such large amount of money to buy a spectrum to be used in my, in my factory, right? The other one is, uh, another one is the business model. So uh, my, my feeling is that the warehouse owner or, or factory owner, they tend to build their own network. Because if you use LT network, basically you are running your service or very critical data operation over a public network. So you can sort of do isolation, but you still, the network is still controlled by the operator, for example, right? So if uh, this is a, a part of um, 
uh, sentence that I copied from an uh, uh, article from uh, the ABB Industrial IoT Manager. I think most of, many of you may know ABB, it's a leading automation company. So they said as a vertical, I don't want to be buying a SIM from one operator. That means I cannot mi migrate my solution across to another operator. So the, this one basically uh, reflects that they want to take full charge of the network. For example, if you uh, sort of uh, outsource your network to China Mobile Hong Kong, and your, if your warehouse has some network issue and everything is done, and I, I suffer from uh, some uh, loss, okay? There is an argument here, who going to pay for it, okay? That, that is a very important uh, issue that need to be considered. Of course, people come up with solution. They call it private 5G, okay? So private 5G could be solution. What, what is private 5G? It means you still use 5G networks, but you maintain your own network. You build and maintain your own network. But of course, there are challenges. You, 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 as a factory owner uh, and warehouse owner, you need to hire people who can do it. Okay, at least in the design or, or the, or the uh, deployment stage, you can still outsource, but you, you still need to keep people who can do maintenance. You know, if there is an urgent, urgency uh, happens, your, your own people need to be able to deal with that. Otherwise, you need to wait for people to come, already a big loss for you. So uh, uh, another good point here is the, there are some new initiative in Germany that the they German, German government say, oh, uh, industrial automation or this kind of thing is too important to the GDP of the whole country. How about we allocate some dedicated spectrum? So to address the spectrum issue, okay, to, to the industry 4.0 applications. That, uh, they already do, uh, uh, based on the news I read, they already did this. And uh, there is already some factories using their uh, networks based on this uh, dedicated spectrum. So they propose 100 megahertz in the 3.7 to 3.8 giga. And also there is a one in 26 gigahertz, okay? And, but the, the license model is quite different. They, they call it local or regional network. So by, by saying this, if you request and, and uh, get approval from a government to use the, net, uh, the, the spectrum, you can only use it within your factory, okay? Within your warehouse, you cannot use it anywhere else. So this means that uh, a lot, because the warehouse are normally isolated, not putting together, okay? If the government can manage on top well to plan the spectrum usage, this could be a solution, okay? For example, for adjacent factories, adjacent warehouse, they do not allocate them the same uh, spectrum, the same channel. So they can avoid the cross-channel interference. But this, this also uh, let me think about this. So uh, when you have some dedicated spectrum, unless the government says you can only use 5G in this spectrum, I can also move Wi-Fi to this spectrum. For example, you may know that Wi-Fi 6 is already on the market. It, it already have very good performance, but Wi-Fi, the key issue for Wi-Fi is it's running on ISM band because they need to have a lot of polite operation, for example, listen before talk for CSMA. But if I move this one to the dedicated spectrum, Wi-Fi could be very well there, okay? Another one is Wi-Fi 7 is on its road. Wi-Fi 7 also care about these time-critical applications. So uh, uh, IEEE are pushing hard on this uh, standard, okay? So my, 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 my feeling is at this stage, I'm not clear who going to win in, in this war, okay? So, but I would say this will depend on the government policies, really depend on that, okay? Uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned, security is another major concern. So uh, wireless is uh, much less secure than its wide counterpart due to the open nature. It means if you send a signal out, although if you try to do very directional transmission, the signal can leak to other direction. People, people can receive it. The, uh, and today's solution for the uh, factory, factories 
is they do isolation basically. They, they can do a, a use different uh, measures to make sure that your factory cannot be accessed remotely uh, via the internet, okay? But so uh, this, this could be some um, major concern because uh, wireless is easier to, uh, for attacker to give a swap to insert malicious, simply jam the medium, okay? These are uh, uh, very, very serious issues. And this could challenge the reliability and the timely transmission that required by your application. So for example, if you, you are going to control a collaborative robotic, and if you do not control it well, and, and some control command uh, is lost during the transmission because of the jamming, then the robotic may behave uh, something that you don't want the robotic arm to do. It may hurt the people around, okay? So uh, 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 a very uh, important point to mention that Actually, in the, in the uh, priority of the security concern, the office are IT priority, security uh, priority, and, and the automation priority are totally not the same, okay? For example, if you see the, uh, the figure below, uh, availability means uh, if you want to use the network, the network needs to be ready. And the integrity means you can always identify whether the device is uh, claimed as it is, okay? For example, there may be some uh, fake device want to join your network and send very critical information to your control center. You need to be able to identify that this is a fake, fake one, not a real one, okay? The third one is confidentiality, means only the legitimate user can receive the information that I want to pass. Other users, although they receive the signal, they cannot decode it. This mainly rely on the uh, cryptography method today. So, for example, for today, if you use online banking, actually they use this uh, encryption for, for, for cryptography uh, things, uh, for confidentiality. You will feel that sometimes you need to wait sort of uh, a few seconds before it reacts, because you need to compute, make sure, authenticate you, you are the, the right person. It's okay. Allowing safe, it protect my, my, my financial information. But for the industrial side, you should ensure the reliability, but at no cost of the availability. Means you still need to be able to deliver the critical control information. By at the same time, you need to ensure the security. Okay, so this is means it's much challenging. Okay, so. Uh, with last slides, I'm going to briefly introduce our work here. So our work is mainly to, uh, is to build high performance industrial wireless network. So we, we are neural between 5G or Wi-Fi. We focus on the problem. We focus on the technology. We don't care whether it will be used on 5G or Wi-Fi. So we, we build our prototypes to test different technologies. So what we're going to do is to tell the industrial or the academic uh, 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 researchers what could be the limit of different technology? That is what we, we do. I, I would like to also use this opportunity to call for problems in Hong Kong. So if you are using wireless in your business, in your automation business, if you feel wireless is a bottleneck in your, in, in your business, please do come to talk to us because we, we are very interested to work with you to identify the problem and hopefully we can come up with some solution to solve your problem, okay? With that, I conclude my talk. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. So may I invite the speakers uh, for our panel? Right? So interesting talk. Uh, you know, I think Henry is uh, quite different from you know, many of our professors. I think he, he come with a, a very application angle as well, and, and actually, that, that's exactly. I'm what, adaptive, yeah. actually. If I talk to a professor, it's not like that. Oh, is that right? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. okay. But any, anyway, uh, uh, we in, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, we we always hoping that uh, you know, uh, apart from the basic research that we do, uh, everything can be more down to earth. And this is the the very reason that we are uh, well connected with Astri, uh, as such that like the final slide that Henry said that you know you want people to bring up the problems. And I think uh, the problems come with the industry. And I think uh, our connection with Astri uh, will actually 
uh, unleash these sort of potentials, as you mentioned. Okay, anyway, uh, I think uh, we should concentrate a little bit more on the uh, application side of it, I think. So uh, uh, this is an open panel and, and uh, the audience uh, online are welcome to actually raise any questions. And my, uh, my colleagues behind the, the monitor will actually uh, you know, uh, take note of that. Uh, okay, so ask any questions anytime. So, uh, so let's, let me kick off first. Uh, I've written down uh, something. Uh, well, it has been uh, uh, kind of a serious, uh, not a serious problem, uh, some myths, I would say, uh, around in Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of people uh, in the industry or even the government talk a lot about reindustrialization. What is it? What is, what is it got to do with 5Gs or wireless in general? Uh, can anybody of you uh, can kind of shed some light, or maybe from you know Winston first? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, just like yeah, just like uh, the, I think the one the PPT I just presented, I think. Digitalization, digitalization will become one of the most key uh, driver for 5G, especially for really industrialization. Because uh, if you think about the factory or the road, um, if we can leverage some kind of technology, can digitalize that, and that will lead to automation. So eventually automation means productivity. So in Hong Kong, I think uh, we are lack of spaces but automation could happen anywhere. You don't need to leverage lots of big space, but some for, if, as long as you can do the, uh, the automation, but for proud to do that, you need uh, digitalization first. That is why we talk about a road and a factory. Um, be, before auto, autonomous vehicle hit the road, you need to digitize the road first to make an make a, a autonomous vehicle be smarter and make a better decision. Same for the robot in the factory. Make sure that the, all the every single table, every single machine is digitalized, so the robot will recognize that and do their job. So I think that's uh, automation is a key, uh, from my perspective, for reduce the industrialization. Yeah. Okay. So I think I, I, I quite agree with on what you can say, but then it not not I would I would like to add something not only about the industrial side. Even actually the education industry, we also have lots of opportunities there. And uh, you know that the COVID bring a lot of uh, stuff uh, challenge, very, very uh, large challenge for education. So students, even for, especially for our engineering uh, subject, students cannot come back to lab, students cannot uh, uh, do labs. That is a very essential part of learning engineering. Uh, skills because they need to understand the knowledge point, they need to practice to understand that. So actually I also put some effort there uh, on doing, actually uh, we're also trying to leverage 5G there. Uh, we, we, are, we are working with a professor from EM department. So you know that for, for their students, they need to do some experiment to see how the cell change uh, in different conditions. But also for research students, they need to do a lot of experiment. Uh, and, and also that their experiment is very time consuming. So previously they sometimes need to get up, if they live in campus, get up uh, to the lab very late, late night to see how time can, because they need to do something if something wrong. It's like a baby they're looking after. So what we are doing is try uh, to use a uh, uh, connected uh, equipment. We use a robotic arm there and it's connected by the internet. Also the, their uh, uh, scope, microscope also can be connected to the internet. And basically the student or the research uh, student can observe what is happening there. But currently what we are doing is uh, through the cable, but uh, later we may think about to use 5G to make the system even better. I think that I would like to add on top of what uh, Vincent mentioned the industrial side. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no industrialization at all. I mean, we have a lot of industries previously. I mean, people talk about, you know, uh, the industry is dying in here. I mean, you are saying that re-industrialization, they're trying to bring things back. There's no market, no industry. 
when, what, what we read this realization, a lot of people doubt about whether Hong Kong should be still running, you know, you know, industry at all. They talk a lot about surfacing, you know. So now you are saying, uh, you know, the government is trying to put re-industrialization uh, as one of their agenda agendas. But some people said that we did not have industry at all. Then why bringing something back, old back? That's one one problem. The second problem is I, I think they, they talk a lot about digitization as well. I mean, it's not an easy thing. I mean, I've been running this job for 20 or 30 years, and now you're going to, you can, you, you want me to digitize my thing. Digitize, digitization of an old company is not an easy thing. If it were, if it were a startup, that's a different ball game. Mm. I think uh, we've talked about, first let me address the, uh, the digitization part. Um, I think it's not that we want to do digitalization uh, for no reason. I think there's something that we must address we, that lead us to digitalization. Uh, I'll give an example, autonomous vehicle. Everyone is talking about autonomous vehicle gonna hit the road in 10 years. But like, like always, I, I explain to lots of the government officials or even the vendors that if I'm a government, I, I'm gonna allow the vehicles, the autonomous vehicle hit the road. But I do not have this kind of knowledge to evaluate which is Google's car better or Tesla's car better? Who's, who's more ethical? Who's more logical or it will not happen on the road? The, from government perspective, they really do not have that kind of bandwidth. What they can do is they have to make sure something that can build the infrastructure from the infrastructure wise, they can help the vehicle to make a better decision instead of let them to make a decision by itself. I think that's where the, the government's uh, V2X perspective, uh, transport development, I think they need to do something to just not sit there and let them to apply and give them permit. And that should not be the way. A more uh, active way is you digitalize the road and make it at several level. Uh, level one, level two, and take your time and don't have to be uh, day one, you digitalize everything. But eventually when you fully digitalize the road, at least you know what, how many objects on the road and you can broadcast your traffic lights a signal to the vehicles uh, to that level, then you probably can try to have the vehicle to hit the road because they will not only see by itself, it will see the whole road because it's been digitalized. I think that's something because the, the, the technology is there, that is why we need to do the digitalization, but definitely they will not happen in day one. But, 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 but I, I don't have any problem with that. The V2X thing with automatic vehicles, you yeah. know, how you build the framework, the infrastructure, uh, as an en enabler for vehicles. I don't have any problem with that. Well, go back to the original problem. We are talking about re-industrialization. And my comment is there's no industry in Hong Kong. Yeah. But we've been doing services. Maybe so, let, let add, add something there. Yeah. There were industries in Hong Kong. There was. Yeah, right. So uh, why move out? Because of the, I think it's the labor cost is one of the main reasons. <laughs> Lack of what? Labor cost because the labor cost is higher. I think mo most of the industry move, move to the mainland because the labor cost there was cheaper. But as I mentioned that in today, as also uh, Vincent mentioned that there are some new technology coming. So uh, we, uh, we can do automation instead of use uh, lots of labor in intensive technologies. We, we can use robots, we can use a lot of other things. In terms of this, then the, the re-industrialization, uh, my understanding is how to leverage the uh, advanced technology and try to make the industries of Hong Kong to go back again. Um, another uh, point I would say, uh, industrialization or re-industrialization is not only about manufacturing. There are also other uh, industrial sector. For example, healthcare is very important uh, industrial sector. Um, but there was not before, before the digitalization. But, but today, if you have digitalization, you have lots of record and people even can collect some very critical uh, data information, even there at home. Then based on that, people, uh, I also know that uh, several professors in our uh, university have very good data working on that. So that would, I, I would say that we should not narrow ourselves down. So we should keep our eyes open. There are new industrial planning, re-industrialization, not only about manufacturing, 
instead we should use the so we have leading university we have a research institution like, like the, the, the what we should do we should leverage the technology developed by the lab to make Hong Kong's industrial to go back I think I think that's what I would say so uh, and, and that is why I think uh, it's the definition itself uh, I mean laymen sometimes think that uh, industrialization means manufacturing I think uh, I mean, according to what you said that 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 would be the problem I mean just like uh, like Winston said about the uh, uh, mobility for example that is an industry so if you treat it that moving from manufacturing to mobility industry so this is also reindustrialization yeah. Yeah. and I, I also agree that uh, the optimization part I mean uh, because you need digitization once you have the digital data, therefore you can do a lot of optimization. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one of the one of the things that I believe in uh, for industry for manufacturing, for example, uh, as you said, uh, a lot of our industry has actually moved north. So, uh, but um, uh, in the past uh, decade or so, you can see that the local factories are actually coming off. So, therefore, the pie has been cut thin. We, are, we although we still have Hong Kong uh, factories there, but the portion of the pie that we have is lesser. Okay, so therefore your your revenue will be less. So in order to make a much higher profit margin, you need optimization because you want to cut costs. So that's where where we come in. So if you we still want to stay, you know, in the industry, army manufacturing industry. So from that perspective, I think uh, 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 that's what we that's what we need. I think, uh, but there's also another saying that well, when we talk about reindustrialization, okay, one is what I said about kind of is sort of saving the the the, the, the Hong Kong uh, you know manufacturers business in in the mainland. That's one one, one direction. Uh, also, there's a saying that of bringing industry back to Hong Kong bringing industry back to Hong Kong. So if the costs of labor can be reduced, if the operational costs can be reduced, then then they can afford to come to Hong Kong, which is quite, quite expensive in those aspects. So that's why uh, that's another way of, of looking at it. But but I, I think I think just the manufacturing industry is really, really not enough. Like I think I, I agree with you both that uh, you know when we think about the in, the word industrialization, we should be looking at a more broader sense like like mobility. Like uh, like health, for example. Even for logistics, because Hong Kong is in, it definitely an international logistics center. So a lot of things come into right. Hong Kong and then go to mainland and go to uh, A lot of uh, uh, parcels go to Hong Kong and go to international. So that is uh, also very important thing regarding reindustrializing. Right, right, right. But but the logistics again, this logistics industry. Uh, I think I think I think we should we should we should look at the thing. Uh, the market is actually thinner, thinner and thinner, yes. because there are a lot of competitors coming in uh, from the mainland. In fact, so but we, we should actually stay with a stronghold when this with this logistic business. But again, because of the competitor coming in, uh, therefore uh, our revenue is deeply cut. So we should keep our operational costs low in order to have a good margin. And to do that. We really need digitization. We really need optimization, just like what what what, what you have said. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So so so, uh, but, but but I think I think uh, I think I don't know. I mean, uh, this little message is I think has to be. I mean, there will be the work of Astro, for example, to, to make it you know you know better known to the to the to the public, you know, to the industry, knowing what we mean by reindustrialization, and then they should not just. Uh, you know, so narrow-minded and uh, looking into manufacturing yeah. only. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good. Okay. So uh, we we talk about uh, uh, health. Health is one thing that we talk about. Well, in fact, uh, this is something that uh, uh, people worry also. Uh, we talk a lot about this as well for the past two years because of the pandemic. I think the world has changed. Uh, so in that sense. What what uh, uh, what what is the sort of the uh, the uh, the the role of five Gs in the post pandemic era? Hmm. I think uh, lots of places I think around the world is being affected. 
but uh, as I mentioned, uh, lots of digitalized or virtual uh, technology become very popular during the pandemic. And uh, I think 5G provides the flexibility for uh, an advanced mo uh, mobility uh, capability to, to for the consumer to access to all this virtualized uh, contents or virtualized uh, thing. I think so, so from that perspective, I, I strongly believe that 5G will continue to grow. Uh, I think most of the the problem right now in Hong, uh, in, not in Hong Kong, around the world, it, because of the pandemic, the operator is not able to, is not be able to um, deploy fast enough for the base stations across the countries. Uh, like Australia, US, they have a big plan in 2020, but because of the pandemic, it's been delayed. But Hong Kong, I think with, we are fortunate enough, right now in Hong Kong, we already have like 70, 80% of coverage we are actually the number two, no, number three around the world have this kind of coverage for 5G. So I think that is why I think they, after pandemic, uh, Hong Kong will be a, in a leading position for the 5G application to drive. And I think this is where the digitalization will kick in. Uh, we will leverage 5G to see what kind of new industry we could uh, explore uh, with this uh, kind of infrastructure. Uh, but, but, uh, so, so, so when you said the lead, uh, what was the scope? I mean, leading in the world, leading in, 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 in leading in the world. Yes, we are the, actually other than uh, uh, South Korea and the mainland. We uh, Hong Kong actually the third around the world in terms of uh, network coverage. Oh, okay. and because of the pandemic, uh, all the all, all the lots of countries around the world, especially the big countries, they are not able to they are not able to uh, uh, roll out that fast. Actually, we have the edge actually, and an advantage in terms of uh, of five G coverage. You said rolling out. Uh, uh, not so fast is true, but uh, but when you talk about the, uh, the size of our market, the scope that we have in the home is so small. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, when we talk about you know China, Korea, you are you are much bigger than us. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's actually another. What I'm say, trying to say is, because Hong Kong already have this kind of uh, full coverage, uh, I think the, the a five G. I think there's lots of application we can leverage and uh, we can use leverage the 5G uh, mobility or, in, or lots of things that we can leverage the technology to come up to the, uh, for example, the new market uh, can, can it be explored here in Hong Kong, but there's not much they can do with other countries that don't have the full coverage of the, of the 5G. So that, that's true, but, but we, we always said that uh, for some pandemic or, or any, anything to, to do with medical, I mean, uh, with, with a small population of 7.4 million, I mean, we do not have enough cases to test the application. I mean, for te testing the technology, I, I guess it's okay. I mean, but, but if you really want to have real, real applications, it's not easy. It's, our size is so small. I mean, when you, the question come up, when you mentioned about leadership, I, I, can, I can accept that, uh, you know, in terms of launching the thing, yes, we have, a, we, 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 we have, a, we have an advantage or we can go faster. But in terms of real application, the number of applications around in these small places is, is just it's not enough. Yeah, if you think about um, what, I'll give you another example in the, in the mobility part. Um, people, we, we would talk about the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, autonomous vehicle hit the road. Um, one of the key, uh, if you think about uh, autonomous vehicle, we believe the first uh, autonomous vehicle hit the road gonna be the public transport. They're gonna be buses. But what you need to do if there's no people driving the bus uh, from the government perspective, from a regular regulatory uh, perspective, they need to guarantee someone can take over the bus in real time. So what, you can, so what that means is you need a remote driving from day one when you hit the road. How to do that? You need to have a full coverage of 5G and we have, you need to have a low latency and high speed bandwidth. So you need to have this kind of thing to really launch the autonomous, uh, trans uh, autonomous vehicle or in the public transport services. And I think Hong Kong is uh, already there. Actually, uh, from my perspective, uh, we will, uh, I think we will, we will see uh, from some uh, solid plan from uh, or either government or in the field very soon, I think they, they actually have this, com this kind of dis discussion for Hong Kong, uh, especially the future about autonomous uh, vehicle in the public sector, yeah. Uh, I was asking, uh, I, I do not sort of disagree that a small place cannot do something big. 
So for example, for Hong Kong, it's very small, right? We, we have a couple of several leading universities. And when you see us, I think I attended a, a, a talk given by RGC, I think it is the, the, the chairman of RGC. He, he said, oh, in Hong Kong, we, we are as a small city, and we have, uh, I think, four university ranking in, in top 100. And this, this is the, I think, rank the first in all over the world. And I, I, by saying that, I mean, uh, Hong Kong has its um, some uh, advantage. For example, we have a lot of, uh, in terms of uh, density, population density, we are large. So, so we are, in the, I mean, the total area is small. So for example, testing many of the use cases of smart running. And also the, the people here may be, I would like to help, point number four, many of the technology, if you want to test in large scale, you do need to have people to, to I mean, uh, point number four, autonomous driving, or uh, at this day, maybe many assistive driving. You need to do the driver to collaborate with you, to give you feedback, to improve the technology. I would say that based on what, I know Hong Kong people are more open-minded. I, I, I would say that they may help in the process. I mean, if the S3 going uh, forward, in a, uh, I mean, uh, in, as the plan, and Hong Kong people will cooperate on that, I would say we may be able to lead in the, the, the mobility industry, maybe in the, in the near future. Yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah, I think, um, Something I want to talk about and share. We recently talked to engage with different academia thoughts, and uh, because actually we do a lot of platform IT, we build a fundamental uh, platform of, uh, like AI platform, for example. What we find out is that the machine learning platform by itself they actually not work that much. But they will become smarter and smarter when they train. But Hong Kong, I think what the Hong Kong people best is the adoption, and uh, we we do a lot of. Uh, because of there are some pain points, for example, in the airport, the staff is actually building their own learning. They keep, every day they have a robot here running in the airport and they learn all the algorithm and we, we find their structure and that IP will come to them. And then they can replicate that part, that the technology to different airports around mainland and Asia area. And this is a small company, like 10 people. But because they, they, they could work out with their own algorithm, and do the data training because they, they, they are very good in adopting technology and they know where the customer needs and they quick access to it. And they're actually in a very good uh, advantage position actually. Actually, they're doing quite well. They're already uh, working with the online airport and they're now they're working with lots of main airports as well, replicate the technology because the learning data is beyond them. And they have the cutting edge from that. So this is from a technology professor. Uh, Back to the previous question, um, I think that small company can do a lot of things, uh, especially when we talk about digital data. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to own a huge asset to become big. Mm -hmm. The knowledge and digitalized the data to become a part of your asset. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that either. I mean, uh, one of the things about uh, open data is sort of you know, liberalize, liberalizing all the I mean, ideas. So once you get the data ready, and then people can uh, throw in their own ideas. I, I do not, I do not doubt that. I mean, when, when we come to this point, we were actually thinking about uh, <laughs> you mentioned about the leadership part. Okay. So uh, it seems that in the discussion, uh, 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 it seems that Hong Kong maybe we need to actually more focus on particular areas. For example, like you said about mobility, you mentioned about the airport thing. I think uh, according. According to what I know, like in the last, uh, in the last uh, 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 policy address, they, they also mentioned about building up a smart airport project. Okay, and, uh, and, then, and then I think uh, uh, for that particular project, for example, for you said we are cutting kind of inside on certain applications rather than you know looking at it broadly. Like when you mentioned about the, the world leadership thing. Question that that hit me before thinking about in a broad sense. I think uh, you know, if we can narrow down a little bit our scope and specialize in the areas that we are. I think that makes sense. Thank you.
Oh, anyway, uh, I received some questions. Okay, so uh, uh, oh, so this one is uh, thanks for uh, sharing, and I hope to ask. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I hope to ask more about why to choose five G and wireless. Uh, I, I saw Steam, <laughs> 5G wireless uh, over other solutions. Say for the sorter examples, the sorting lines are set to be fixed and no much need for mobility. Wired solutions are more cost saving than why we change to wireless solutions. <laughs> this, this is, uh, let, me, let me try to answer that. This is actually quite a good question. So, uh, uh, I mentioned that this is actually the reason why wireless is not that popular in, in the industrial world. And this, this is because previously, uh, there are no, not many use cases there. Though people are trying to push forward the technology. The technology side is uh, still advancing, but there are not too much um, use cases there. But Besides the, uh, the uh, as I mentioned, then the logistic, also the manufacturing, people uh, are tending to be more like, for, for example, the customized product. For example, I, I, I like very special designed shoes instead of the, the, the common one. And people more like this, uh, this kind of thing. This will totally change the trend of the product. It, it, it's um, it's so-called flexible manufacturing. So in this kind of things means previously, for example, if we make shoes, we make three uh, uh, size uh, 37, size 37.5, th size 30, 38, a bunch of that. And then we stop everything and then reconfigure the, uh, reconfigure the production line and then reproduce another batch. But today, the bench may go to be very small. For example, we only make 10 shoes in one bench. And in that case, if you use cable communication, what you need to do, you, everything needs to be reconnected and then reconfigured and then try and then reproduce. For if you use wireless, for example, you use this module, then this module will automatically move in and then form a, 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 a production line and everything will be faster. I mean, um, not in, in, in many cases, for example, AGV, wireless is essential, but even for some cases that your production line is fixed, but you need to frequently config, reconfig the production line. Wireless will give a lot of help there. I will, I will answer it this way. Okay, thanks. So, uh... You have any follow up questions, then you can just uh, put it on the uh, uh, our chat group. So the next question is about uh, electricity consumption. Seems that uh, if we adopt five G solutions, I mean the you know power consumption will be high, and it's not very just, you know environmental friendly. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I think uh, right now it's the early stage of five G. Um, we I think that that, that concern is uh, valid because a uh, uh, lot. Sometimes we trade the, the power consumption with uh, higher coverage than the higher. Sometimes we trade uh, the power consumption with uh, with higher coverage and how, uh, higher performance from the base station. But I think uh, it needs, especially it, the same same hap thing thing happened to four G when it launched. The, it actually uh, have a very high power consumption. But uh, you can see lots of uh, lots of experts, lots of companies already uh, put AI in, in into the whole solutions to try to trim down the total power consumption. Uh, of 5G uh, from daytime and nighttime, they differentiate the time, uh, the usage, because 5G base station, lots of 5G base using beam, uh, beam forming, actually, they try to find ways to minimize the power consumption from that perspective, to, uh, to low down the power consumption. And also, lots of uh, places that are rural areas, they even uh, talk about uh, using leverage the solar power technology to, to support the base station. I think eventually the industry will, will just try to solve that problem. But that is one thing I think this um, something is, un, is inevitable. As I mentioned, 5G penetration is quite low. Um, when we talk about the indoor especially, 
uh, you were expecting more and more like ultra dense network. That's ex you're expecting 100 meter per base station. So that kind of density is how you balance the power and also the, the performance. That's another uh, key issue need to be solved by the industry. But right now, I think the the whole there's a big topic at the working group on the power consumption. I know like lots of vendor Ericsson, Huawei, they have a huge group of people working day and night to to solve that problem. But I agree that could be a, a big problem in the initial stage, but eventually it will be solved by the industry. Yeah. Paul, I think that give a very good answer to that question. So let me add up a little bit from the. Uh, academic side. Actually, the how to reduce the energy consumption of 5G is still a very hot topic in the in the academic world. So people are uh, develop uh, very advanced technology. So for example, if you have a receiver just talking about we are using a lot of antenna. So instead of using one antenna, if your transmitter need, for example, need to transmit one watt, and if you use multiple antenna because you receive multiple copies of the signal, then the transmitter side can use much, much lower transmit power so that we can save the energy consumption. So this is one example. I mean, um, uh, people are well aware of that. I mean, researchers in the area. So people are do working in that area, try to solve the problem. But, but it, it is not a very short term problem. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, the operators, you know, when they build the stations and then they, they are, you know, they use up a lot of power, eventually they will charge back. I mean, it will be the layman, you know, people like me who will be suffering high bills. Yeah, as, I, as far as I know from mainland, uh, I'm not sure Vincent know that or not. I, I read this from news. So because the users of 5G is not that much. So what they do is just turn on the, turn, turn off, in off peak, they turn off some of the base station. Well, but, but this is the, uh, well, that is, is a catch-22 mm -hmm. thing now. I mean, you know, on one side, you really want to popularize this 5G thing. Yes. And then now you said that, oh, I'm glad that it is, uh, you know, nobody is using it, therefore I can cut down the, cut down the cost. But this but, is, I mean, uh, this is, people are thinking about how to save the energy there. I, I know your point that yeah. uh, the, how, how to share the, 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 the build of the energy consumption. But that, that, that's business, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I build the stations and with, with a high cost, eventually I'll charge you back. Technology they are trying to do it. For example, I'm not sure whether Vincent uh, know that why the C run means we are trying to put a lot of data processing unit to a pool and all the cooling, are, actually the main power consumption, one of them, is uh, how to cool the, your base station because your base station needs to transmit a lot of data. And how to cool the, 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 the machines within your base station then consume a lot of time, not, not about transmit power. So people are doing using smart way is how about we, we put all the, uh, for example, if you have 100 uh, base stations, instead of put separate cooling system in 100 base stations, we pull all the processing machines together and build one common uh, cooling facility. That will be much more efficient. Yeah, and also uh, in my previous uh, PPT, I, I mentioned the one concept called a neutral host. This is actually why the people talk about this topic a lot, because um, especially in Hong Kong, if you know the Hong Kong spectrum, like 3.3 gigahertz, been divided the 100 megabytes. Oh, sorry, uh, 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 100 uh, uh, bandwidth. Uh, the, the, sorry. Uh, the, the 100 megabyte bandwidth been uh, chopped uh, into four portion to diff four operators, but actually they can share uh, one single base station to serve the whole 100 megabytes uh, bandwidth to have a better performance. Instead of building their own base station by one by one, and they should share the infrastructure and this actually reduce the, co the total power because if you, 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 you uh, and this where the neutral host come in. If I have a build, I'm a building, a building owner, I can build the infrastructure in advance. And all operators do not have to invest that much money to, to on the base station. They just leverage my existing infrastructure and a share between operators. And that it will significantly lower down the, the power consumption issue as well. Yeah. So, uh... Again, and uh, the other question, uh, 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 Henry mentioned about the uh, the security, and then both of you mentioned quite a lot about 
uh, the, the cloud computing part. And then, for example, as the vehicle goes along, and then everything will actually go to the cloud and then work out the, uh, it has an AI algorithm. And then, you know, and then with that, you can avoid obstacles and things like that. Okay. But, but that actually involves security as well. I mean, when everything is centralized, so firstly, it can be, you know, the single point of failure is also can be a single point of attack. So it's also a problem, no? Um, I think that um, in terms of the security part, we can divide it into two. Uh, one is a, a SaaS network part. That means the whole 5G security. Well, um, cellular network is, uh, is there for 20, 30 years. And they actually, you, you heard lots of a data center or the banks, uh, the data center being, uh, being hacked, but it's rarely, rarely to hear that the one of operators being hacked by the, because the cellular network, they have a licensed network and the whole, the whole 3DPP, the whole group of people that's working very hard on the, the whole security channels to provide the, the most security. I think that this, this is one of the advantage why we probably prefer the cellular in terms of security part. It, cellular is, is a little bit better than the Wi-Fi part because Wi-Fi still is open. Uh, cellular is uh, secure uh, by its own way. And if we talk about the cloud, when the data call, go to the cloud, and this is where actually where we, we need to discuss about whether it's a public cloud or it's a private cloud. Um, there are so many solutions around nowadays, but I think the cloud computing is also been there for 10 years or 20 years. It's also keep evolving. That's, and you can see lots of, if you go to the public cloud, you have the first protection from all these big vendors. It was as rural though, they already have a lot of solutions for the US. But in terms of uh, security part of data integrity, this is where we kick in also, that's what I also mentioned in my PPT, we're working on the leverage the 5G infrastructure and also blockchain for to do the data integrity because we are expecting a massive IoT or massive data in the future under 5G. So I think there's two, lots of ways. Uh, first protection from the uh, the major vendors or cloud vendors, and for the data protection, we also introduced lots of new technology to leverage the 5G like blockchain IoT. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite familiar with the computing or cloud computing security side, but I do, I do have some um, investigation into the RAN network part. So I, I think uh, the security concern is valid there. So there do some issues or, or researcher in the area that can show that I can, or there are also some accident, I'm not sure internationally, or, or I'm not sure whether Hong Kong has that people put a fake base station, small one, into their back, mm -hmm. and then they move along in this area. Mm -hmm. And they use higher transmit power, and your phone will think that is a valid one. And it send you, for example, you are going, going to online banking, they send you a fake uh, website, and then you put your password and username there. So it's possible they can get it. But this kind of thing is rare at this stage. I also think, I also realize that um, people in the security area, I'm not a security expert. People in the security area are also trying to find out ways to deal with this kind of thing. I mean, um, especially in this connected world, security is always the first concern to me, I think. Okay, okay. okay. so uh, uh, the other question, well, this is a simple question, I think. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, a very valid and very down to earth question. Uh, what's the difference between the use of 5G uh, for telephone and for IoT? Very simple. Um, I think the difference um, using 5G on telephone and uh, IoT, right? Um, I think, as I mentioned, from a consumer perspective, um, when we're using the phone, uh, uh, serving on 5G, the first impression impression is a uh, faster speed. That's a high bandwidth. That's definitely a uh, hit to the uh, cell phone part. But in terms of um, IoT, actually, we can it, IoT is covered a lot. Um, but most of people talk about IoT. They just think about a smart meter, smart metering. But vehicle IoT is also part of IoT. Mobility that require high bandwidth. You want to con remote control a vehicle. You need a high bandwidth. You need a low latency. There's I think from v I, uh, 
uh, IoT perspective, especially under 5G, lots of people talk about, as, as mentioned, uh, automation that require lots of information exchange with fast speed, low latency, and decision making. And this whole, there is a whole pattern for the, 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 the machine to talk to each other. I think it's not just about the connectivity, it's where you connect, you connect them and what kind of execution you want them to do and what kind of result you want to collect and then what kind of analysis behind that's linked to the machine learning. So I think this, uh, the process, I think the difference between phones is it's just one way you enjoy the internet, you enjoy the over the top services on Google's from a consumer perspective, but IoT requires a lot more. It's not just a connectivity. And above that, I think the operators and also the industry experts is introducing more and more uh, interesting uh, platforms to add to the 5G infrastructure. Um, Vincent already gave a very good uh, answer to that. Uh, maybe I just add a little bit. So, uh, in terms of the different kind of service uh, that cellular network provide, mainly it's voice and data. So originally, for example, the first generation, the second generation, many developed for voice for mm -hmm. telephone, and then people think, oh, whether we can transmit data on that. And then on the 2.5 gig, uh, sorry, 2.5 generation. We, we, we realize that, and then at that stage, you can send message or text message. And later, go to the third generation, and people can send a picture. Now, nowadays, you can send mm -hmm. short video, right? So, in turn, this is how the, 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 the technology evolved in the, in the serving people side. But as I mentioned in my talk, IoT is not mainly about serving people. Of course, people can be involved, but it's still, it's mainly about the machine to machine communication. So in machine to machine communication, there are two, uh, generally two categories. One is time critical one, one is time non-critical one. For example, people are talking about the smart metering. This, this is just non-time non critical one, just for monitoring purpose. For example, I monitor your, your, the temperature in a factory. It's just monitoring. If, if you have some data get lost and, and have some delay, not, not a big problem. But for some, for example, a smart driving or too much driving car, you are, you are not very tolerant to the delay. For example, mm -hmm. if a people show up uh, in front of autonomous car, there should be a very short transmission, very, very, very timely deliver that this info, uh, people will show up. You need to slow down, you need to wait. So in these kind of things, we need to go beyond the technology that used to serve people because people's sensitivity compared to machine is not that high, than I would say. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, when you read a lot of, you know, uh, newspaper articles, they also said about uh, disruptive innovation. Uh, the idea of, uh, you know, machine to machine rather than people to people, this is disruptive innovation. And, and uh, without 5G, you would not be able to connect them. And uh, one of the advantage of 5G is, is connectivity. So let's give a very simple, simple example so uh, they said that one person at least at least can be connected to 100 people. So imagine that you have uh, you know sub, you know eight billion people in the world. Then in the future you have 800 billion con you know small little computers connected to, to each other. So without the the bandwidth, without the latency, without the connectivity, you would not be able to do that. So therefore, uh, uh, there are two different uh, types of applications. But there are also article, uh, newspaper articles, not, not research articles. They also said that um, uh, when we talk about the, the 5G as a commercial, as an industry, uh, we are the real, you know, money generating, the golden egg, the money generating part is not consumer, it's not consumer product, not telephones. The real part is actually the industry, you know, collecting data, how to move data around. That's where the money comes from, okay? And for that, uh, therefore, there was some, some saying in the article also saying that uh, during the, uh, the, the, the China and US trade war, uh, people talk a lot about, oh, uh, they, they, they look into the 5G thing, uh, then people mostly talk about the telephones industry. But uh, when you're really looking at it, you know, both countries are looking much further, 10 years further, looking at the industrial part of the thing. 
So uh, back to this question about the differences between the two. One is, you know, uh, you know, ba based on you know consumers. Uh, it is important because we use it all the time. But for for the for the enterprise, the real business part is actually comes from the IoT. Yeah. Well, that's my understanding anyway. Okay. So um, so while we're talking about this uh, China and America thing, uh, again, this is something that. Uh, been circulating around, you know, in the in the, in the world. I mean, or if, especially in Hong Kong, will there be two networks in the future? So it seems that uh, it seems that they are fighting against five G, you know, and it seems that uh, you know they are they are not you know giving up both sides. There was a saying that there may be two different you know networks. Will that happen? Actually, I think uh, for someone. Professor Wong uh, raised a very good uh, point uh, from previous. It's about IoT. People will focus on the phones and uh, they really forgot about IoT and how important it is. I think this is this is where the, I think um, lots of people think that the uh, US uh, and China, China will eventually lose or, or uh, they will stay strong. Uh, I think that's different perspective. I think the IoT will be a key, key uh, uh, point and for, for machines, you don't really need that, that strong computation, and you don't really need, need the five nami <laughs> chipset. And China already can make the chip, uh, IoT chipset by itself. So, it re I really, if you win the IoT, you win the five G. I think that that could be valid statement. And then, from my perspective, in China is not that uh, been limited by the Western country. But from another point, I think. Uh, Western country, they actually, for example, the U.S. right now, they're pushing the 6G, what they so-called the 6G, even it's not fully ready. But uh, I think they try to, uh, to to choose a different battleground uh, against, especially uh, like China or the Asian countries. I think uh, that actually eventually, from my perspective, I think 5G is inevitable. That's the, the generation. You have to have built up. Uh, like my, my boss and my mentor always say that, Every, um, I mean, all G will be successful. <laughs> if you go to 2G and 4G, they all the, the cash cow. But you need to have 1G and 3G to set the foundation, and then you can get the money from. So I think I don't think the 5G will be, will be unsuccessful, but I would say 5G is inevitable to get to the 6G. And people will, we need a discussion like this to talk about why we need 5G, why we need a higher bandwidth, what are people gonna involve or how we can make machine to talk to machine. I will not, I'm not saying it will not uh, totally an unsuccessful case, but this kind of discussion will lead us to a better future and uh, evolution on the communication technology, yeah. So, so, so if, if according to that definition, I mean, from a university point of view, because 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 it's it's more about creating applications. Without applications, there's no point of having five Gs, right? So uh, maybe we'll first go back to your original question re regarding the trade war. I would say it will cause some. Uh, of course, it will co cause some effects there. But in terms of the competition over five G, I think uh, the the. The, the outcome is clear. I, I would say that China, what my personal point of view, China leads that, okay? But uh, uh, as uh, Vincent mentioned, 6G is coming. So people are talking about 6G. Uh, and also US government also are putting effort there because they see 5G because China government and, and, and researchers put a lot of effort there and they start to lead there. So. They are thinking about 60. This is one of the articles that I read the other day told me. It's not written by me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, in terms of your second question, in terms of the role of our uh, researchers in universities, I would say uh, uh, we, we are not 5G or 6G. Uh, we, this, we, these are, uh, we are neural on that. But of course, there are some university are uh, trying to say, oh, we are developing some white papers on 6G, something like that. But I would say that is just some visionary uh, point. It, it's, not, it's not yet clear, at least to me, what will 5G look like at this, 
uh, sorry, what will 6G look like? Because the potential of 5G is, is still not clear yet. So because we are still trying to find the killer applications of 5G, we are still at that stage. But I mean, for, for, for researchers in universities, we are focusing on technology side. We just, so we just do research to tell oh, whether this technology is good or bad. That's what our role. And in terms of how it is used, it, it, it will be determined by the market. Okay, there, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but uh, well, we back to the the the, the, the circle again. When you when you said about this five G five G application, and 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 we we have not find a killer app yet. But in fact, when you really you know listen to the public now in the in in, in Hong Kong, we have four Gs. We haven't you know fully utilized our four G bandwidth yet. What's the point of having five G? There's a lot of people talking about that. I mean. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> is, is, is that the case? I mean, there, there are a lot of 4G, you know, app bandwidth that has not been fully utilized. And it seems that it, this, uh, the government is, you know, hard, you know, pushing very hard on 5G thing. So, but in fact, I mean, even if we do, have, even if we do not have 5G now, we, we can still survive with the 4G part, right? Yeah, I think uh, that's a valid question. Um, from that, as I mentioned, from a consumer perspective, um, just a faster speed on their phone is really mean not a lot, lot to them. But from per, uh, operators' perspective, uh, you know the five G, uh, the four G base station, they are actually um, is actually in Hong Kong because of the, the the density of Hong Kong and also the building to to have a great plan for operators in Hong Kong for the perfect coverage is really really hard. It's a burden to them especially about when we talk about capacity. You know how hard to, to rent the space to put your base station on the top of building in Hong Kong? I think we, we have to give credit to all the operators in Hong Kong that did a great job. But still the capacity in terms of uh, capacity, 40 is still not enough. Um, if you see about how many people come out from the, uh, from the underground every day, like Chin Sa Choi, all the central, all this area, they still have a lot of burden. But 5G will solve that kind of Issue, especially for the hotspot area. That is why you see the lots of operators is, is putting the base station in the uh, in the hotspot uh, for the for their first phase of the deployment. And also the, the I think that's um, that's that's from an operator's perspective perspective. And also for the consumer, you will see the megabytes per second right now is actually significantly lower. Eventually, of course, you see that the, the tariff is actually. Uh, is compared to 40 is a little bit higher, but if you calculate 100, 100 GB or 200 GB package, the the, per, uh, the percentage uh, the, the the megabyte uh, sorry um, the dollar per GB is actually much lower compared to traditional 4G. Actually, eventually the consumer will benefit from it, but with, let's see whether there's a huge application killer application that will drive the consumer level. But uh, eventually, I think the the, um, the consumer will benefit from it. So, uh, what about the, uh, the the two the two standards that I mentioned? You know, would it happen? I mean, people were people really worry that uh, because of the competitions between the two countries. So, so, so maybe the they, they both of them will set up their own kind of you know network so uh, standards. For, for, for today's standardization of five G, is mainly pushed by three GPP, and all the country are all the countries are follow that. But in terms of the politic, uh, political issues, whether it will happen, I think I'm not a, a, a good position to judge that. I would say I don't hope that. Okay, so uh, this I guess is the the final questions. I think uh, 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 I think we, we talk a lot about uh, the Greater Bay Area. Okay, so what's the situation now about uh, transmission, about you know data connectivity? Between the two places, uh, well, a lot of people, you know, really uh, say that there seems that uh, the data cannot be so easily uh, go across the border. Um, or maybe even you said that there are two standards. There would, there would be two standards: one in Hong Kong, one in one in one in one in the Bay Area. So. Uh, would that hinder the popularization of this technology uh, in, in, in GBA? 
Yeah, I think the in terms of data security or uh, this uh, privacy issue, if if the data relate to the personal data, definitely. Uh, uh, even me, I don't I don't see is is you you need to cross a border to share all this kind of personal data. But I think um, in terms of IoT, like especially for logistic, all there's uh, is already being globalized. You can, see, you can see lots of IoT devices now. It's a it's a global roaming. It, it, that's why the people introduce the eSIM. Uh, the concept you don't even need a sim card you just e-sim it's just a, in software and you put it on the uh, cargo or on the, on the item and you can ship around the world the track is that, that that kind of information you really need to share and to trace the especially under the pandemic you have to make sure your your food is safe enough from origin and all the to the supermarket so this kind of information across the border across the gba i think is fine but we're, we're related to the personal data and that that's the, these kind of regulation. It's not something that you can be standardized by the global. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say something from the industrial side. From the industrial side, uh, from even from government uh, level, um, they try to make the, the this border less effect in, effective in that perspective because you will see that there are more and more ground than promoting the researchers in this great Bay Area to work together to develop technology. And even the, the cars now can drive through from, from uh, I mean, for in terms of autonomous cars, I, I, would, I would say that uh, sooner it will can be drive from Hong Kong to Shenzhen, no problem. I would say that will not a big, big issue to me. <laughs> I think uh, we are about time. There, there are two uh, sort of uh, uh, more, more, more uh, kind of simple and practical question. As <laughs> one is about uh, uh, about science park, about the, uh, the testing science park uh, automatic vehicles. How can we participate? Uh, uh, or maybe you can the the audience. I mean the uh, the, the you can uh, email us and then we can provide more information. And the other question was on actually uh, Astri summer internship. What would be the most important skill candidate? Should have again. Uh, uh, you can you can save this question and send it to us. I will make sure that that question uh, will be directed to the right person. Uh, so I think uh, we have a, a very fruitful discussion. Uh, so right at the beginning, I mentioned that uh, uh, you know the Chinese University of Hong Kong, our Faculty of Engineering, is actually working very closely with Astri. Um, we really want we do a lot of you know uh, uh, very top notch research, but we really want to make them you know. Uh, you know, uh, 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 apply uh, to real, 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 real situations, of real business. Uh, so therefore, uh, we work very closely with Ashley. Uh, and then uh, this is only the uh, the first uh, talk we have in our series. And then uh, there will be uh, several coming up very soon. So uh, uh, so I would like to uh, remind uh, the audience to uh, uh, keep track of that. Uh, and uh, and 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 do join us. And I, the time is short in here, so if you have other questions, either relate, uh, uh, you know, other re related to any of these speakers or or, or to the organization itself, uh, do let us know. So uh, with that, uh, do you have any other thing to say? Yeah, I think uh, I think the last I think the question we do need to hire more talents from the industry. So. Please feel free to uh, yeah to ask any question related to how to join Austria. We're more than happy to welcome you. Yeah, yeah I, I'm already for my problem at the end of my talk. Uh, I'm very interested to solve real world problem because as academics we have learned many theories for tens of years. We are we are very glad to find some application that can make our theory useful. That I would like to say. Okay, thank you very much with that. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>